plants. That is just common sense, Mr. Speaker, that that's going to be diverted or the possibility of diversion is going to be uh, increased incredibly. Um, we've seen in Colorado increased uh, admittance to hospitals because kids actually get their hands on edibles. And he may say that, that we won't be allowing the sale of edibles, but certainly people will be making more and more of these. So my question is this, why should Canadians believe anything this Liberal government says when we have respected uh, professionals such as, as those in the Canadian Medical Association say that this approach is silly and that this approach, if they really cared about the public safety of Canadians, should not pass. Why should we believe them over the medical professionals? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Um, I think I'd answer by, by simply asking, uh, how can we believe them when the approach that they've defended for 10 years and that they still do to this day has failed so miserably? When minors, when young Canadians under the age of 18 report that they've smoked up to 20 percent, that's amongst the highest in the world, that youth 18 to 25, 30 percent, that's the current approach. When criminal organizations generate profits estimated to be $7 billion a year through the sale of cannabis, that's the current approach. That's the approach they're defending. They can put their, hand, their heads, Mr. Speaker, as deep as they want in the Senate and pretend that the current approach is working, but it is not. And I'm not the only one saying it. Le, le barreau du Québec, la the Quebec Bar Association, the, the New York Times, The Economist, Leftist Magazine have come out with quite clear position that prohibition is not working. We need a new approach. And I am very proud to be a part of a government that has the lucidity and the responsibility to move forward with a new approach on cannabis because the current one has failed. Questions and comments, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the previous speaker, uh, the member from Belchasse, the Sechemin Levy, made reference to a number of uh, organizations who are licensed producers in this country. And he made a suggestion that, well, more than a suggestion, he actually made a bold declaration that somehow there has been some kind of political preference that was given to these particular licenses. And you named four of them Tweed, Canopy, Aurora, and Hydro Apothecary. And, and I just wanted to ask my member, who, my, who's a parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Health and knows something about the license applications, would it surprise him to learn that all four of the organizations mem mentioned by the previous member in his speech received their licenses from him, from his government, not from ours? Like, would he not be shocked, given, given the extraordinary declaration made by the member opposite that there's somehow some area of malfeasance on our part? for an action that he took. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. I, I want to I thank uh, the Parliamentary Secretary for the great question, because if you look at the licensed producers in Canada, out of the 43, 30 have been approved under the previous government. And I would suggest that the member who spoke before me asked the former leader of his party, uh, who approved most of them, how the process works. And he would learn that it's arm's length and that it works very well and that there is no political interference whatsoever. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Beauport Limolou. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask the Parliamentary Secretary a question, an objective one, a serious one. These aren't party lines. I've read a number of newspaper articles where they talk about Colorado, where there have been some perverse effects. Now, without getting into the issue of the health of young people or the moral issues, but allegedly there are high costs in Colorado for road accidents as a result of this. And so I wonder if the parliamentary secretary has an opinion on those facts that we're reading about uh, from the state of Colorado. What is the government's view when it comes to the objective facts? There are high costs. Uh, related to road accidents resulting from cannabis use. And I'm not talking about uh, ethical uses, issues. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm always surprised when a Conservative starts a speech like that, and I appreciate uh, the member opposite, so I'll take his question seriously. The approach that we're taking in Canada was inspired on successes from other jurisdictions, 
we've learned from mistakes that were made in Colorado. And what distinguishes us here in Canada is that we're the first jurisdiction to take a public health and safety approach to it. I'd invite the member to read Bill C-45 and look at the tools that we're going to be giving police officers for detecting cannabis, the other measures. And he will realize that today, Canadians, if they think that they can drive under the influence, they will know that there is zero tolerance for people who exceed the limits, and there will be tools provided so that people who have the, come up with a bad idea to drive under the influence of cannabis will be dealt with. I think James is in a boy heading lead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to, to rise and speak in support of C-45, an act respecting cannabis and to amend the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, the Criminal Code and other acts. At its core, Bill C-45 allows individuals above the minimum age of 18 to purchase cannabis from a licensed retailer and possess a maximum of 30 grams. This legislation also allows for home cultivation with up to four plants for residents and ensures that access to cannabis for medical purposes will be maintained. The bill has three specific objectives. It creates a legal and regulated market for cannabis to take profits out of the hands of criminal and organized crime. It protects public health through strict product requirements for safety and quality, and it imposes strict, serious criminal penalties for those who provide cannabis to young people. Criminalized in 1923 under the Act to prohibit the improper use of opium and other drugs, the reasons why the possession, manufacturing, and purchase of cannabis should be illegal was hardly debated. As parliamentarians, it is our obligation to debate to the best of our ability the critical issues facing Canadians here in this important institution and to create the laws that protect them and their inalienable rights. Today, we can have that debate that never occurred in 1923. Mr. Speaker, the prohibition on cannabis has failed. It victimizes ordinary Canadians and it emboldens criminal elements in our society. The current prohibition on cannabis disproportionately targets minority groups in Canada and has altered the lives of anyone who received a criminal conviction for carrying a small amount of marijuana, including lost employment opportunities, immigration issues, social stigma of being branded a criminal, and imprisonment. Mr. Speaker, it is worse than the problem it was designed to protect us from. Our government acknowledges that the current prohibition on cannabis does not work, and now is the time to take an evidence-based approach. As an emergency room physician, I have seen many tragic things. This includes the effects of prohibition on Canadians. The effects that I have witnessed ranged from organized criminals targeting citizens to instill fear in a community, to the murdering of competitors to protect their profits, and the killing of innocent bystanders. This is the impact of prohibition that I know and I have seen. Just as an, outside, as an aside, during my time in the emergency room, I have resuscitated patients who have overdosed on opioids, cocaine, and it should be noted, Mr. Speaker, alcohol. But never have I had to resuscitate anyone who was only under the influence of marijuana. The only true beneficiaries of prohibition are the criminals who profit from it. Much like the prohibition on alcohol in America in the 1920s, Organized criminals continue to see a lucrative opportunity in today's prohibition. By legalizing and regulating cannabis, we can take revenue away from those who terrorize communities and take loved ones away from their families. I understand that many people have concerns about this legislation and our youth. Everyone in this House, me included, is concerned about young Canadians using cannabis. But right now, it is easier for children to acquire marijuana than it is for them to acquire tobacco or alcohol, with our youth having some of the highest rates of cannabis use in the world. Drug dealers don't ask to see identification or verify someone's age. When we regulate a product, like we do for cigarettes and alcohol, we can restrict its usage to persons above a certain age and ensure there are consequences for those who provide it to them. The legislation creates two new criminal convictions, giving or selling cannabis to youth and using youth to commit a cannabis-related offence. This legislation does three things to protect children. It creates a minimum age of 18 years for the purchase of cannabis, although provinces and territories have the right to increase this age. 
It provides for public education and awareness of campaigns of the dangers associated with cannabis. And it requires childproof packaging and warning labels. This also prohibits products or packaging that are appealing to youth, selling cannabis through a self-service display or vending machines, and promoting cannabis except in narrow circumstances where the promotion could not be seen by a young person. At this moment, there is no product safety in the recreational cannabis market. Cannabis sold by organized criminals could be laced with harmful pesticides or herbicides or other dangerous drugs. I am keenly aware of this because I have treated patients who smoked cannabis, but were not aware that it contained something else. The legislation protects the consumers of cannabis by implementing industry-wide industry -wide rules and standards on basic things such as sanitary production requirements, a prohibition on the use of unauthorized pesticides, product testing for THC levels and the presence of contaminants, and restrictions on the use of ingredients and additives. There are minor, these are minor standards that we hold so many companies and producers of innocuous items accountable for, and for too long there was a product used by many Canadians who were not aware if the product used pesticides, contaminants, or was laced with a dangerous substance. Essentially, consumers have to take organized criminals on, on their word that what they're consuming is not dangerous. Our government will be investing additional resources to make sure there is appropriate capacity within Health Canada, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Canada Border Services Agency, and the Department of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness to license, inspect, and enforce all aspects of the proposed legislation. One of the concerns that have been brought up to me by my constituents is persons who are under the influence of cannabis and who are operating a motor vehicle. And their concerns are completely valid. Evidence shows that cannabis does, in fact, impair an individual's ability to drive. Impaired driving is the leading criminal cause of death and injury in Canada, and rates of drug-impaired driving are increasing. In 2015, there were more than 72,000 impaired driving incidents reported by the police, including almost 3,000 drug-impaired driving incidents. That is why our government also introduced Bill C-46 at the same time it introduced C-45. C-46 proposes a significant modernization of the impaired driving provisions in the Criminal Code and is designed to protect the health and safety of Canadians by creating new and stronger laws to deter and severely punish impaired driving. This legislation also provides law enforcement with the tools and resources they need to improve detection and prosecution of impaired driving. C-46 proposes to strengthen law enforcement's ability to detect drug-impaired drivers by authorizing the use of roadside oral fluid screening devices. Canadian police forces have tested devices designed to detect cannabis as well as other drugs in a driver's saliva. Police have been asking for these resources, and we will deliver. Mr. Speaker, there have been concerns that this legislation will lead to widespread cannabis use. In fact, there is already widespread cannabis use in Canada, and our rates of usage are among youth and adults are the highest and higher than other uh, jurisdictions that have legalized marijuana. Mr. Speaker, our society is dealing with a myriad of problems due to cannabis, but most of them are in fact caused by its prohibition. This legislation will take revenue away from organized criminals, implement, for the first time in Canada, safety standards and they actually solve many of the problems and make it harder for our youth to acquire marijuana. This legislation will make Canada a safer place for all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Question and commentary, the Honourable Deputy de Bellechasse. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Echemins de Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite said that Canada was uh, facing a number of problems and that the government's approach was based on science. However, in Colorado, there isn't... Uh, one, two, or three, but seven uh, factors that are detrimental. There's been an increased consumption among young people, and they're consuming earlier. Arrests, people are arrested with uh, more drugs. There are more deadly accidents. There's So there are a number of issues. Did the government learn any lessons from this? Because when we look at Bill C-45 and we look at what's happening in Colorado and the science, we see that uh, it's actually devastating. So why 
launch into this type of an adventure that's going to create more problems. And it's not proven by science. Rosewood, St. James, Assiniboia, Headingley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to thank the honourable member for his uh, question. Uh, I agree that uh, it is, uh, if we are legalizing this, we should look to other jurisdictions that have legalized it. Uh, now, the data that the, other that the member is quoting from Colorado, uh, I'm uh, wondering what sources that he is using. Uh, two sources that I have been uh, using from Colorado are a report issued by the public health officer, chief public health officer of Colorado, and a report by the public safety department of Colorado uh, that have both said that there have been some increases, although the data they admit is very, very hard to interpret because up until now they have not been tracking this. So to compare what was happening before the data was being tracked to what is happening today uh, does not make uh, much sense in the way of comparison. And even the comparisons that they are making are not showing these effects to be devastating. They are showing that there are some effects, some negative effects, but it is unsure whether these actually reach statistical significance. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Kootenay, Columbia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Honourable Member from Charleswood, St. James, Assiniboine, Headingley, for his work as an emergency physician, and because I used to live in Winnipeg as well. Um, I do have one question, because I really am confused by it. It's in the proposed legislation, it will allow a young person between the ages of 12 and 18 to possess up to five grams of dried cannabis without criminal sanction. And there's also a social sharing provision where youth can share up to five grams without being accused of trafficking or transport. Uh, and uh, uh, to me, that just flies in the face of trying to protect youth. And so I'd be really interested in hearing the members' views. The Honourable Member for Charleswood, St. James, Assiniboia. Thank you, Mr. Edward. Speaker. Um, there is a misinterpretation of uh, that uh, statute. In fact, this does not legally permit anyone between the ages of 12 and 18 uh, to carry marijuana. What it does, it, uh, there is a, basically a ticketing offence that does not lead to a criminal record. And contrary to what an earlier speaker says, the substance is in fact confiscated. So there is a sanction for this, just not a criminal record. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in the 1920s, uh, prohibition uh, was a terrible failure for, for alcohol. Uh, and criminals profited from it. People died from the consumption of it uh, because alcohol, there was no tight regulatory regime uh, uh, controlling alcohol or over the consumption, uh, or composition, I should say, of alcohol. So fast forward to today. And the same thing, the miserable, terrible failure of, of marijuana. Uh, criminals are profiting from it. Uh, there is no control over the composition of marijuana. Uh, there is, you know, but there is, but, but you now look at alcohol today, there are tight controls, a tight regulatory regime over alcohol, and it's created a much more responsible environment around the consumption of alcohol, and more importantly, the composition of alcohol. So would the member not agree that by ending prohibi prohibition of uh, uh, cannabis will actually be, in a, it will be beneficial to, uh, to society? Thank you. The Honourable Member for Charleswood, St. James, Assiniboia, Headingley. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would agree with the Honourable Member. Uh, the, uh, as I've said, in my own medical practice, uh, I have had patients who came in who had consumed what they thought was simply cannabis. Uh, and in fact, what they came in was with obvious toxic syndrome, syndromes consistent with other ingestions. Uh, it was clear that nothing else had been ingested to their mind. But what in fact had happened, uh, as we have said, uh, there's not a lot of quality control in a substance that is produced by criminal gangs. Uh, and we had people seriously ill based on the contaminants that were put in. Uh, this will lead to a strictly regulated product uh, that has to be, that is not available to the public uh, unless it is subject to strict quality controls, like we now have today with alcohol. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Megantic Calérable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It I'm pleased to rise this evening to speak to Bill C-45. 
the legalizing marijuana bill. To begin with, let me tell all my colleagues that, first of all, I'm not an expert, and uh, secondly, I'm not a doctor, and thirdly, I'm not a police officer, nor am I a scientist. Fifthly, I have not studied to an extent that I would be an expert in drug consumption. But one thing is certain, Mr. Speaker, is that this evening, as a father of three children, I rise tonight to speak about this uh, bill that aims to legalize marijuana. I have heard so many lines that are spoken differently, but uh, that are said over and over again on the government side of the House this evening that I'm beginning to think that the government's will to legalize marijuana is just one way to fulfill an election promise to please a portion of the electorate so they'll vote for them again. And this is one of many such promises the Liberals made just to get votes. And now they want to precipitously fill, fulfill this promise and they're forgetting something that's quite fundamental. And that is that by legalizing this drug, young people, youth, families, will suffer, that there are people who will suffer the consequences of this decision. And, Mr. Speaker, I think that this does dishonor to this House and to these MPs to simply repeat talking points provided by the Department of Health, by, uh, I'm sure it's not from the Department officials, but the Health Minister's office, and just keep repeating them over and over again, not ad nauseum. To to try to convince them, to convince us, rather, that they are doing this for the good of society. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague from Bechas Les Echemelevi, who in his speech compared our situation with that uh, in Colorado. Someone w else was wondering about the sources uh, quoted in my colleague's speech, and it was professors to, uh, in, and researchers in Colorado who uh, studied and analyzed the consequences of uh, marijuana legalization in Colorado. And there are seven of them. Unfortunately, in his speech, my colleague didn't have time to elaborate on those seven aspects. But since I have a little more time left over, allow me to do so for him. And then I'll get to the substance of my speech. It, uh, first of all, the majority of drivers, impaired drivers, that were uh, stopped in 25 to 40 percent of the cases, it, it was about marijuana consumption in Colorado. In 2012, there were 10.4 percent of Colorado youth from between ages 12 and 17 that were considered to be regular consumers of marijuana, as compared to 7.5 percent at the national level. Colorado is now ranked fourth across the country and 39 percent higher than the national average when it comes to uh, marijuana use. So thirdly, the suspensions and expulsions of students for using marijuana in schools have increased by 32 percent between 2008 and 2009 to 2012, 2013. And most of them were because they had contravened the rules by using marijuana. Then, fourthly, 26.81 percent of, of university-age students were considered to be regular users of marijuana, as compared to 18.8 at the national level, which made Colorado the third highest in the country, and 41 percent above the national average, Mr. Speaker. In 2013, 48.4 percent of adults in Denver that were stopped and tested positive for marijuana, which is an increase of 16 percent since 2008. Between 2011 and 2013, there was a 47 percent increase in emergency room visits amongst marijuana users. And the seventh aspect is hospitalizations that were related to marijuana use increased in 42, by 42 percent in Colorado since 2008. 
So if you want to compare, if you want to talk about facts, I'd like to thank my colleague from Berchas, Lisa Chimanevi, for having provided that information, which I did not have. Because across the way, they're saying that we've found solutions to all these problems, that we've resolved problems. But in fact, that solution has caused many more problems. If you look at where this has done been done before, and if once again it's families and youth are going to suffer the most and are suffering the most in Colorado, Mr. Speaker, I have concerns, and I've had I've been worried about the same thing since this bill came out. For, firstly, the government wishes to take the profits of a drug trade out of organized away from organized crime. And secondly, they're saying that they want to reduce access to marijuana f for young people. Mr. Speaker, that makes no sense at all to, to say those two things when you're trying to legalize and make it ordinary and normal to consume uh, marijuana in, across the country. First of all, let's talk about prohibition because we, they keep using prohibition as an example, that after prohibition, organized crime lost uh, many, uh, lost a great deal of profits, that now alcohol is a regulated market. I met young people from grades eight in my writing, grade eight or nine, over the last few weeks. And I asked them the question, the following question. Uh, sometimes I even ask the teachers to leave the room so I can get an honest answer from the children. And I asked them, how many of you have already consumed alcohol? You know what, Mr. Speaker? Every single student in the classroom raises their hand. Every student raises their hand. And these are 15, 16 year olds. As far as I know, it's forbidden across Canada to consume alcohol if you're under 18. And yet, this is a regulated substance, it's managed by this is by the state, and everyone is, knows that it's illegal to consume alcohol under the age of 18, and yet all the six, every 16-year-old I've met uh, has consumed alcohol. The big news here, Mr. Speaker, is that the Liberals are claiming that by regulating marijuana in the same way alcohol is, mar is regulated, that youth will consume less of it. Let's spot the mistake here, Mr. Speaker. What's going to happen? Simply that it will be uh, more normal and easier to consume marijuana. It won't be cr a criminal act anymore. Perhaps a young person who was hesitating because they didn't want to break the law or have a criminal record may go ahead and have that first puff. And perhaps for, for many young people, it will just be occasional or they'll just have that one puff and stop. Uh, but those people who have problems, who are having trouble at home or elsewhere in their lives, those people may feel better if they use the drug, and it may be for the first time in their life. What happens with those, with those young people? It's not going to just be once, twice, or three times. Those people will continue to use the drug, Mr. Speaker, and this is what concerns me as the father of children. The re this, that's the reality because that's what happens in real life. That's what happens when you go around and speak with people, when you talk to young people. I asked young people, these young people a second question. How many of you have ever tried marijuana? How many of you have smoked a joint? How many of you have tried it at least once? A third of them, approximately, in each classroom. It may vary 30 to 35, sometimes up to 40%. Uh, raise their hand in front of their teacher, in front of their father, uh, because it looks cool. But I guess it's not that cool because only a third of them raise their hands. But now, when I ask those people, do you agree with, mar with legalizing marijuana? Those who tried it don't all raise their hands. And there are fewer, fewer of them agree with legalizing, the idea of legalizing marijuana. 60 to 75 percent of the young people I met that are 16 and under because they're in high school do not agree with the notion of legalizing marijuana. And when I discuss this with them, you know what they tell me? They say, I, we don't agree because we saw what it did to our friends. One of our friends started 
using it and has now dropped out of school. He used to be a good student. He used to be a fun friend. And then he left our gang. He, he changed. He completely changed. He moved over to a different group of friends. And unfortunately, he's not one of us anymore. And this is young people telling me this, Mr. Speaker. I'm not just talking about statistics on, a, on paper. I'm not talking about uh, uh, false consultations to justify an electoral promise. These, this is straight from the mouths of babes, Mr. Speaker. Now, then when they talk about taking profits away from organized crime, Please, Mr. Speaker, let's come back to alcohol. This was a product that was prohibited, and at that time, governments had a, the good idea of, of saying, let's take control over alcohol back, and let's hit organized crime in their pockets. What's the result today? Organized crime doesn't exist anymore, Mr. Speaker, as a result. Radio silence, I see. Does organized crime still exist? Has organized crime managed to continue to make money? Yes. What did organized crime find to replace alcohol? Drugs, marijuana. Mr. Speaker, organized crime is highly organized. If you withdraw one way to make money, what will, it, what will those groups do? They'll just find something else to sell. And it's even more worrisome for us because we have seen over the last few weeks, months, and years what organized crime is choosing to produce and sell, and those are chemical drugs. And we have no control over those at all. These drugs, these drugs uh, hook people instantly. They, be, they become instantly addicted in some cases. So these because that's what those drugs do, unlike marijuana. And those organized criminals will make sure that young people who bought marijuana legally now move on to these other types of drugs. So it's just rainbows and unicorns to believe that by legalizing marijuana, organized crime is going to cease to exist, Mr. Speaker. And that is very worrisome, because those people are always going to be there. As long as we are unable to hit them where it really hurts, those people are doing terrible things for money. We have to be able to put them in jail. We have to be able to prosecute them. We have to make sure we can nab them and punish them for what they're doing. And it's not by legalizing what they're not doing so well. Uh, and making it more acceptable that we'll be able to do that. I cannot accept that, Mr. Speaker. What's even worse, Mr. Speaker, is that this bill tells us how we're going to go about legalizing marijuana. A bill that tells us that pe young people between the ages of 12 and 18 who are caught with marijuana, well, we'll leave it up to the provinces to decide what to do with them because we've legalized marijuana, and then we don't really care what happens to them. That's what Bill C-45 is doing, Mr. Speaker. We're going to allow those young people to be in possession of marijuana. We'll say, that's OK, it's legal. What kind of message are we sending youth, Mr. Speaker, against all medical advice? As of the age of 18, it will become legal. And I would like to come back to the famous pot plants, Mr. Speaker, that's going to be allowed uh, to cultivate, that people will be allowed to cultivate in their homes. Uh, in my family, I've lost people to cancer caused by people who smoke cigarettes. We hear a great deal about uh, cancer cases that, uh, that are attributed to secondary smoke. What about small children, four, five, six-year-olds who go home, the same home in which their parents are consuming marijuana? Mr. Speaker, what's going to happen to the owners of these buildings whose renters have decided that all of a sudden, well, it's legal now. I can smoke, I can consume marijuana in my own apartment. I'm not sure if you've ever entered an apartment in a building 
an apartment building where someone was smoking or smoking marijuana on the same floor. It's terrible. You have to walk through a cloud of smoke and you know exactly what it is. It's like here when you, you know, on, on April 20th, when you walk through the hill, you, you know what you're smelling. It's incredible how strong that smell is. And those things, Mr. Speaker, already existed. Those things already took place, but now it will be legal. So it will take place more frequently, Mr. Speaker, and that's what worries me. Mr. Speaker, this bill has absolutely nothing planned to help families and help youth, help parents who are going to be facing consumption problems in their children. How can we support them? How can we make sure that young people won't want to smoke marijuana? Because now we're sending out a great message. Oh, yes, the bill is saying, oh, you cannot, you can't make uh, attractive pra uh, packaging. It will just be a black box and it says pot and the quantity. That's it. That's all that's going to be allowed on the packaging. Well, pot is still pot, Mr. Speaker, no matter how it's wrapped up. What we need to do is tell young people not to touch it, not never to take that first toke. Families will be stuck with these with youngsters who tried smoking pot and end up using chemical drugs and hooked on pills. And there's nothing in this bill to support those families. And so the government is asking us to trust them, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about the lives of our children, Mr. Speaker. We're not here to debate something that is completely unrealistic that we'll never see transpire. We're talking about my daughter's life, my son's life, all of our children's lives, and yet it seems so easy for them to keep repeating talking points provided by the minister's office to say, yes, yes, marijuana must be legalized. It's going to be easy. How do we know that they're talking points, Mr. Speaker? Well, it's quite simple. They're all saying the exact same thing. They just keep repeating it. So what I said, no one else has said before. I didn't repeat what anyone else says. I spoke from the heart, Mr. Speaker. Did you see me reading my speech? Yes, I am speaking uh, to you, Mr. Speaker. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I'm speaking to my colleagues. Mr. Speaker, did you see me re reading my speech? I'm speaking from my heart. And I really wanted to share my feelings and thoughts with my colleagues. I'm not trying to convince them to change their promises, to change their minds. I just want them to abandon this idea and think about the consequences for our young people. They should think about whether it's really worth it to go that far in legalizing marijuana just to fulfill an election promise, no matter what negative repercussions it's going to have on all young Canadians. Mr. Speaker. I have all kinds of arguments before me that were prepared by my uh, assistant. CBC's got polls saying that Canadians, and especially Quebecers, are against legalizing marijuana. I have in my hands all kinds of reports from the World Health Organization saying that there are all kinds of negative impact on people's health, impacts on people's health, especially for youth, teenagers, parents and adults when they consume marijuana. I've got a study here that says, that talks about the effects of secondary smoke on babies and fetuses if their mothers are smoking, Mr. Speaker. I've got many, many numbers. I could have given you nothing but numbers throughout my whole speech, and yet, Rather than quoting all of these speeches and or studies, rather, and all of these numbers, uh, I would just then they'll stand up and say, "Oh, well, I've got studies that saying it's not going to be so bad. I've got studies that counter what your study says." I, I would prefer to rise and speak from the heart, Mr. Speaker. Why? Because I'm personally concerned. Uh, the, this is going to affect my children. It's going to affect all the MPs here who have children. This is a file that sh should be. Uh, highly worrisome for all of us. I cannot understand, Mr. Speaker, why, if this government goes forward with this bill and legalizes marijuana, that the MPs across the way agree with this government going forward without there being any prevention measures that must be mentioned because the amounts they've uh, announced for that are ridiculous. 
nothing to nothing announced to support pro uh, the parents of these children who will have all these problems. And when we're talking about prevention, prevention, I mean, what are we going to do to say to young people, it may be legal now, but it's not. It's immoral and it's not good for you, and it will harm you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member from Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for his wonderful speech. I've been here for uh, nearly two years in the House, and I've heard the same speech over and over again. And I recall when the former leader of the Conservative Party was the Minister of Health. And at that time, there was an approach that had to do with the economic action plan. It was an approach that was based on how could you commercialize everything. So she said, we're going to spend $1.5 million to reduce consum marijuana consumption rates in young people. My only question is, did that work? The Honourable Member for Megantic Lirable. Mr. Speaker, I have no idea whether that worked or not. All I know is that what they're going to do is worse because at least we continue to forbid it and prohibit it. I'm not against decriminalization, decriminalization of marijuana. I don't think that someone who tries it by mistake or just to try the ex tries an experiment should go to jail and have a and, and have a criminal record, not be able to go to the U.S. and not be able to travel and drag that around for the rest of uh, his life. But I do think that young people should continue to be told that it's not good for them, that it's bad for their health, and that if they t use too much of it, it will completely mortgage their future, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member from jean -Quierre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wanted to come back to what my colleague from Mégantic Lérable said in his speech, during which he spoke of or about organized crime. I would like to hear his opinion on this. There are several articles and studies have mentioned the fact that the THC levels in cannabis produced by organized criminals will be higher as uh, uh, compared to uh, legally obtained marijuana. And so that's not going to harm organized crime. So the government is saying that this is going to uh, hurt organized crime, So, but th that appears not to be the case necessarily. So what is the government going to do? Uh, the Honourable Member for Migantic Lérable. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That's right. As I said earlier, organized crime is highly organized. So. If uh, they'll see quickly that the government is selling weaker, weaker marijuana, so they'll continue to produce stronger marijuana. Organized crime is there, is here to stay. We saw that with alcohol, Mr. Speaker. So organized crime, we must fight organized crime. And it's, we're not going to do that by legalizing marijuana. But once again, I, if we decriminalize a simple possession of marijuana, at least it gives us the opportunity for police officers to intervene because under our current system of justice, if a police officer wants to arrest someone for simple possession of drugs, the burden of proof rests upon the police officer because it's a criminal activity. So the police officer has to prove beyond all reasonable doubt that that person was in possession of drugs. Mr. Speaker, if we simply write that person a ticket, then it's the reverse onus. The onus of uh, the burden of proof is placed upon the person who receives the ticket. And they'll, they'll just get a, sl a slap on the wrist, and it might make them nervous for next time. And if they do it again, then they'll get another ticket, which gives generates revenues for the government. Uh, so it also continues to give the message that we don't tolerate marijuana consumption. And it allows us to continue to fight organized crime because it keeps... Uh, uh, police officers uh, aware of those who are s providing marijuana to young people because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to prevent organized crime and criminals from uh, selling to young people. But at this point, there'll be so much of it all over the place that who will know? Who's to know where it comes from? Does it come from your pot that you're growing at home? Does it come from organized crime? It'll make it very difficult to pursue drug traffickers, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I really appreciate my comments from my colleague. We have some similarities in background with our education and working with students and what we are concerned about. Also with the Peace with Public Health is another part that I've been involved in with the administration of large health regions. So public health in the sense that the number that has been proposed is singular in millions. 
We spent that much in a health region for public health to deal with smoking and were able to drive down the number of people who were smoking, especially with teenagers who are most at risk. And the most at risk group in that was pregnant females, which were really at risk at smoking. Even with singular millions in one health region, we didn't get where we wanted to go with our school students. So would the member please respond again about the similar situations we had as schools as we worked with students and understand how critical this is the education and the amount of money we need, which is sadly lacking in this proposal. The Honourable Member for Megantic Lérable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Listen, the Liberal government has a majority. Are we going to be able to prevent them from adopting this legislation that is going to cause irreparable harm, in my view, to our young people? What I'm asking is if they're going forward with this, why is it that MPs that are parents across the way, mothers, fathers, why don't they demand that their government does everything possible to convince young people not to use marijuana and, that, and to help families around those young people deal with the situation? People seem to be taking this very lightly, Mr. Speaker, but it's a real problem. If they go forward, and we know that they have the power to do so, they have the votes to, to go forward, and, and, and adopt this legislation. But those of you who are not in cabinet, it's time to rise and speak and tell your government that it's time. Okay, fine, do it, but do it right. Put some money aside to help those who will have problems because of this legislation uh, deal, deal with it. Questions and comments? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I've listened very carefully to, to the member opposite, and he, and, he, and he seems to be very focused on a very small, singular aspect of the bill before us tonight, and, and that is the, the issue of legalization. He seems quite loath to make any acknowledgement that there's 131 pages here which articulate very strict regulation for the production, distribution, and the consumption of cannabis, which will be a far more effective regime in the responding to uh, the, the uh, the, the access that children currently have to cannabis and to deal effectively with organized crime. And, and I wanted to assure him, this, my question doesn't arise from talking points. It, it, it arises from four decades of keeping kids safe and protecting my community in Toronto, but also I, over a decade as the chair of the National Organized Crime Committee. And so I do have some experience and expertise in this, and, and I will assure him and perhaps reassure him, and I would draw his attention in this bill to sections 10 through 15 that maintains very strong prohibitions under the criminal law for illegal distribution, production, import-export, using kids in the, in the sale of, of, of these drugs, very strong regulations to control organized crime. And I will also share with him my experience in dealing with organized crime and gambling. It was, a, it was an activity, and, the, and it's still on the books, gaming offenses, but over four decades ago, governments across this country began to strictly regulate gambling, and it drove organized crime out of that business. And perhaps more importantly, the revenue from that business is now invested in treatment and rehabilitation for those who suffer the ill effects of, of gambling. And, and so I just want to reassure the member in, in his comments that this isn't something, it's not a fly-by approach. This has been an exhaustive examination of the evidence and the best advice of experts. He raised a number of issues and quoted a number of statistics which I would hope to have an opportunity to clarify for him in the future with respect to the Colorado experience. But, Mr. Speaker, given the fact that this is a very comprehensive bill and it clearly provides a regime for the strict regulation of the production, distribution, and the consumption of cannabis, which, which in my opinion, and this is based on four decades of experience, will do a better job of protecting our kids, I would urge him to actually read the Act. Honourable Member for Well, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I think that my colleague opposite shouldn't doubt or question whether or not I've read the bill. I did read it because I'm here to speak to it, and I find it insulting to have him ask me if I've read it or not. This bill will increase penalties for people who are selling drugs. It will do everything that the member opposite mentioned. It will also legalize marijuana. And the bill ultimately will result in 
marijuana being trivialized, the use of marijuana being trivialized. It's all fine and well to put 250 pages down, 1,000 pages down. This bill will result in the legalization of marijuana. They want to banalize or trivialize it. Organized crime will continue to organize. Despite the experience of my colleague, I acknowledge he has a great deal of experience. However, Mr. Speaker, I think that there's something missing essentially here. Prevention, education, 1.5 million over five years. They're going to, millions of dollars is going to be made with that and simply not enough is being invested there. The Honorable Member for Richmond, Arthabasco, on resuming debate. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I just uh, saw that I went up the list uh, a few spots. I was a bit surprised. So it's my a pleasure for me to speak to this bill, a bill that will give the Liberals an opportunity to, to legalize marijuana, which uh, has been illegal for, nine, for 24 years, and to do all of this in less than a year. This is such a complex issue, and when we look at what's been done elsewhere throughout the world, we need to wonder why they want to move so quickly. The government keeps uh, saying here, there, and everywhere that it has uh, two objectives, uh, to limit organized crime, to get rid of it, and to keep this product out of the hands of children. But allow me to make a few comments, uh, Mr. Speaker. The first, dealing with the involvement of organized crime, it will not decrease, I can confirm that. Access to marijuana for young people will increase. Drug impaired driving will worsen. Safety in the workplace, because no one's mentioned this yet, will jeopardize the safety of workers. Many corporate leaders are very concerned at present in that regard. There will be housing problems that will increase. There are serious problems, and the bill doesn't address them. There will be more people hospitalized, more calls into anti-poison or poison control centers, and ethical problems will also arise and intensify. These aren't conclusions that I invented or made up myself. These are the results of studies by experts who are not uh, funded by the pro-marijuana cause, Mr. Speaker. That's the reality. These are studies who have been prepared by health experts, scientists who have produced results. And I would add as well, there are concrete examples of places where governments and states legalized marijuana. And I'm going to go over through them, uh, go through them rather. Fighting organized crime. Now, in light of the research that I conducted, legalization will not eliminate organized crime. In Uruguay and certain American states, before they legalized marijuana, the black market was on the rise. And now, there isn't a only a big bad conservative making these points, Mr. Speaker, as the Liberals like to say. But despite the legalization of marijuana for recreational use, the black market is also growing in Colorado. And the state has the largest marijuana production, illegal marijuana production, uh, after California. And who said that? The head of the police service in Denver. Criminals are still selling on the black market, and there are a host of cartels operating in Colorado. The illegal activities have not decreased. Who said that? The Attorney General of Colorado. Decriminalization and consumption have not disappeared. Organized crime simply adapted. They've kept control over cannabis culture and growing. Who said that? a criminologist in Uruguay, someone who's neutral and has uh, nothing to do with politics. Now, what about protecting children? I think that it's contradictory to see that the Prime Minister wants to reduce access to uh, children while allowing at the same time a home them to have plants in their homes. 
And a young person between the age of 12 or 18 can have five grams of ca cannabis in their pockets, Mr. Speaker. What's worse, the government, which uh, says that it's relying on science, Mr. Speaker, science. Well, what does science say? Science says that marijuana is dangerous for people under the age of 25. What's the government saying? Oh, that's not a problem. 18. It's 18. At least, if they were courageous enough, they would speak to scientists and tell Canadians what they hear. And now, I've got another quote, and you'll be surprised to hear it, uh, Mr. Speaker, I didn't invent it myself. Young people are particularly vulnerable to the effects of marijuana use. Adolescence is a critical period for brain development. Do you know where I found that, Mr. Speaker? On Health Canada's website, Health Canada. The government's officials posted that, and that has nothing to do with the Conservatives, Mr. Speaker. Another quote, the number of patients going to hospitals in Colorado following the legalization of marijuana increased significantly. It almost tripled, going from 803 diagnoses per 100,000 inhabitants before legalization to 2,100 uh, 2,142 per 100,000 inhabitants. Where did that come from? From the Department of Public Safety of Colorado, Mr. Speaker. Another example, calls into poison control centers for overdose shot up significantly in Colorado by 108% and in 68, by 68% in the state of Washington. Who said that? The Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Center. Now, now, these, I assume, the government doesn't think these are credible people. I'd like to move on to road safety now, Mr. Speaker, another important aspect in my eyes, because drug-impaired driving is a problem. There are almost as many road accidents due to people who have taken drugs than there, as there are people who have consumed alcohol. And there is evidence to prove that. In the state of Washington, following legalization, death accidents causing death due to drug-impaired driving trip doubled. In Colorado, they tripled. Another quote for you, Mr. Speaker. Legalization of marijuana in the country is of grave concern to members of the CAA Quebec. Approximately 73% of respondents fear that per the proposed legalization will have a negative impact on road safety. Another quote, quote, and just wait till you hear who said this. We've seen an increase in the number of accidents in Colorado because of marijuana use. Who said that? Kevin Sabat, a former advisor on drug policy to Barack Obama. More than half of Canadians who drive under the effect of cannabis believe that they don't represent any danger to road safety. More than 50 percent. Now, what's the government proposing in its budget, knowing that it's going to be legalizing uh, this product? $1.5 million for all of Canada for awareness campaigns. That is completely ridiculous, Mr. Speaker. 50 percent of cannabis users don't believe that they represent a, r a risk. Now, let's talk about safety in the workplace. Many corporate leaders in Canada are concerned that the legalization of marijuana will lead to safety problems on the job. And in recent months, many experts and entrepreneurs have spoken to this. It's very dangerous. I'm afraid that the problem will worsen, and I feel ill-equipped to deal with it. Who said that? Alain Raymond, who is a roofer. Cannabis can have an impact on concentration and uh, reactions. And we also know that cannabis can be detected 15 to 30 days after using it. So if an employee wants, who uses uh, cannabis on a weekend but doesn't want his employer to be aware of it, how does he hide that? Who said that? Hugo Morissette, an advisor in Human Resources in Colorado.
concerns have in fact increased as well and employers have seen the number of in employees using marijuana considerably increase from 20, 2011 to 2015. The CEO of GE Johnson said it was so difficult to find employees who could pass an oral marijuana test that he had to hire people from other uh, American states. So in short, considering the obligations for all employers in Quebec and all provinces, Legalization of marijuana for recreational purposes will expose employers and employees to many issues, legally speaking, and an additional risks, such as more accidents on the job, a risk of absenteeism by employees, a risk of decreased productivity for employees, the risk of an addiction to marijuana, and a risk, the risk of there being more applications for under insurance policies. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's very clear that this bill will not resolve these problems. Oh, I've got too many things to share with the House this evening, uh, Mr. Speaker. My goodness. Well, I mentioned the problems with housing and apartment buildings and such. There's another problem, and it will be related to rental housing. Rental housing owners are afraid that they that people growing marijuana plants will damage their property, well, mo dangerous modifications for the electric facilities required and is a problem. There is a problem with humidity, etc. Now, there are a number of issues, there's so many, so I'll skip to a, a page later down in my speech. Now, health effects. Medical experts agree that marijuana is a dangerous drug for children and teens, and I would add for all vulnerable people. The Liberals hesitate to admit that cannabis use among uh, teens does something that alcohol doesn't to do. It causes permanent brain damage, Mr. Speaker. The Canadian Medical Association has already advised the government, or warned the government, that occasional use can have serious psychological repercussions on brain development up to age 25. The Canadian Medical Association recommends a minimum legal age, and they've agreed to lower the standards to help the government make a judicious decision, a minimum age 21. And what has the government said to that, this irresponsible Liberal government? 18. And they go as far as to say that they're relying on science and experts in making their decisions. Well, Mr. Speaker, they are not doing so. They're simply at they're simply referring to comments made by their friends who are going to get wealthy thanks to the legalization of cannabis. Today, Colorado leads in cannabis consumption among young people. Before legalization, it was in 14th position. So how can liberals reassure parents that legal marijuana won't uh, be kept out of the hands of children. Radio silence. There's nothing. They're not guaranteeing that by allowing people to grow four plants each. There again, how can the liberals claim that children won't have access to marijuana? Radio silence. They are not answering uh, questions. They remain silent on these very important issues. And now this leads me to the real heart of the matter, Mr. Speaker. And it's an issue that I want to raise because last week uh, a friend of mine called me, a friend who'd been watching all uh, the programming. And he said, Anna, explain to me why, or explain to me why, despite all these warnings, the Liberals are going ahead with this bill. Why? And I said, well, there must undoubtedly be a reason, and the reason is simple, Mr. Speaker. It's because it's a lucrative market. 
because those managers who are pro going to be producing the marijuana, well, many of them are in fact have on their boards a major donor to the Liberal Party. So these companies have managers and executives who come from the government. Or no, not the government. No, I mean from the Liberal Party, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to mention a couple of them. I've got so many figures and papers here in front of me. It'll just take me a moment to find the right sheet. Now, we didn't do the research. We didn't need to. The journalists have uh, focused on the issue. And uh, so the co-founder of the only authorized medicinal cannabis, Drew Potekereri, was the national director of the Liberal Party and national director of the Young Liberals of Canada. And that's the only authorized producers in Quebec. And uh, he comes from uh, the Liberal organization. There's another one trying to open up in West Montreal, Chuck Wiffesey. I think people know these people. And we're not allowed to say that outside of the House, but here in this place I can make these comments. He was a director, and listen to this. He was a director of the board and held the position as head of finance for the Liberal Party of Canada. And up until last summer, that's uh, quite recent, just last summer. And listen carefully, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Riffesey was in the position when he co-founded Tweed, which became the largest producer of cannabis for medicinal purposes in the country, worth some one billion. So, Mr. Speaker, we don't have to look that far. We can really see why the government is so eager to move quickly. All of the statistics show that it's dangerous. All of the research shows that we don't have enough information, that it's dangerous for children, and that there are no measures that have been put in place to ensure that children will be protected from this product. Secondly, there's nothing that shows that there will be fewer accidents, road accidents, and our police officers aren't even equipped, Mr. Speaker. I tabled the legislation by our Senate colleague, Claude Carignan. It was the government's uh, lining itself up to vote it down. And it contained measures to give police officers the tools they need to, to take real tangible steps. And the government wants to prevent it from going first. Oh, it came from the Conservatives, a Conservative senator who came up with the idea, with the support of Liberal senators in the Senate. But we don't know who's, uh, wh where those Liberal senators are. But at any rate, it came from the Senate. And the government decided to reject it. Why? To do another one. So the reality is so we won't be ready, Mr. Speaker, now. Let me get back to the facts at hand. The ethical issue. From the outset, the former advisor to the President of the United States, Barack Obama, on drug policy, believes that legalizing marijuana is something that will benefit private corporations and has nothing to do with public safety and public health. His name is Kevin Sabat. He was a former advisor to President Obama on drug policy. We have been misled. Legalization of marijuana in Alaska, Oregon, Colorado, and Washington is a matter of money that was beneficial for private corporations, and the choice had nothing to do with public health. There's a large industry in Colorado, Colorado similar to the tobacco industry, with its own lobby. That's the reality, Mr. Speaker. It has nothing to do with good intentions when the government talks to Canadians. The reality is that it's false, that a lobby is bringing pressure to bear. And in the states where it's legal in the United States, they've all gone through a referendum. And, and in many cases, it barely squeaked through. Where did the information come from? Always from the large marijuana lobby, and that's a reality, Mr. Speaker. Surprisingly, here's what we're seeing in in Canada, and 
Well, actually, I've already mentioned this a little earlier, so I won't go back over that. But I found something else. Someone's going to ask a question about this. The parliamentary secretary responsible for legalization. I was about to say his name. I apologize. I can't say his name. But at any rate, he's subject to an investigation by the ethics commissioner because of a fundraising evening for liberal donors who are lobbying for legalization. I'm sure there's going to be a question coming about that. It'll be quite fun to answer it a little later. During a cocktail, funding cocktail, where the parliamentary secretary was in attendance as a special guest, a participant pointed out that there were many other people from the cannabis industry who would like to attract his attention. So I think we're starting to see things quite clearly. In a recent report in La Presse, we learned that uh, former politicians and le senior leaders, former senior leaders who sat uh, from the Liberal Party sit on the boards of the largest cannabis producers and are donors to the party. So it's very clear. The situation is clear. It's false to claim that the government will be protecting our children, protecting us on the roads. And if the Prime Minister, and I'll wrap up with this, would use his uh, uh, charisma to promote healthy lifestyles. We'd make a lot more progress than we are with this. Southwest. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member opposite uh, correctly says that he is protected by privilege in this room, and quite frankly, he uses that privilege perhaps quite inappropriately. And, and if I may respond to a number of things that he said. Uh, first of all, the, the individuals, the Canadian citizens that he maligned in his, in his remarks as somehow gaining some opportunity or advantage from this government, I would, as I've already mentioned to uh, his colleague, the, all of the companies that he mentioned and all of the individuals who receive licenses, receive them from the Conservative government, from him. And, so, and, and quite frankly, I'm beginning to suspect you are so well versed in malfeasance, perhaps you have a better understanding of this better than I would, but the, the decisions to give those companies the licenses was a decision made by your government, and I would point that out. The member also raises an issue about um, something that I have been in a number of times. Well, member, that uh, I'm sure it wasn't my government. I, he's speaking through the through the speaker. Thank you. Being reminded of that. You know, I, I, I would also mention, Mr. Speaker, the mentor, member mentioned that as a result of a completely baseless accusation made. I, to the Ethics Commissioner, I was the subject of an investigation, and I've been completely cleared. I've also been the subject of a number of other similar baseless accusations that came from somewhere, of which I've been completely cleared. It, it seems to be, if I may suggest, a tactic used on the opposite side to, br to bring these matters forward without any evidence and without any fact. And so let me give him some facts. It just, if, if, the, the fact is, the fact is that our, our children. If, if I may, I, there's some some questions coming up. I, I just wanted to clarify. Normally, we say questions or comments, or questions and comments. There doesn't have to be. I'll let the uh, honourable member for Scarborough Southwest finish up. Very brief. Yes. The, thank you. The, the, the fact is that our children are using cannabis at the highest rate of any country in the world, including higher than in Colorado that overwhelmingly our kids get that marijuana from organized crime. And I would ask the member opposite, are you okay with that? The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Oui, c'est yes. Ça me fait plaisir de dire. What's worse, Mr. Speaker, they're going to continue to get it from organized crime because even in the report that was tabled, that the one that the the parliamentary secretary used to prepare this report. What did it say? Well, they won't be legislating the THC level. They're saying the more it's uh, rich in H THC, the more expensive it'll be. So there's going to be other products that are going to be sold, and then they're going to be saving the 15% uh, tax by buying it from organized crime. That's what's going to happen. At any rate, experience shows that in Colorado, organized crime continued uh, to stay involved. So they need to use data, clear data. 
that speak for themselves. Their own report has stated that, Mr. Speaker. So if there's so much on the defensive today, it's because there's something wrong here. So I hope they're going to wake up because people are waking up. And there isn't a single state that adopted this type of measure without a referendum. They're ramming this down, the government's ramming this down the, our throat to quickly, Mr. Speaker, and that's unacceptable. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Regina Leuven. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague uh, for the examples that he's given us from the United States and for his uh, comments and critiques of this uh, bill. I would, however, like to ask my question to explain the Conservative position to clarify it, are the Conservatives happy with the current system where marijuana is available across the country, where Canadians can get a criminal, uh, end up with a criminal 